Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are logging from. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first session of Glossolon Soil Spectroscopy webinar. My name is Yipen. I'm from Global Soil Partnership, FAO, and I will be moderating this session. Our today webinar will introduce you a very important topic needed for soil analysis, soil spectroscopy. Before starting, I kindly ask all of you to check the Zoom chat as some rules and information on this session will be now posted. I would kindly remind you that the session is organized in a webinar format in which participants cannot activate, activate their audio and camera. However, participants are encouraged to post their questions in the QA box, which will be moderated by the Glossolon coordinator. We will choose a few questions to be answered to be answered live. The rest will be answered via chat. In addition, a chat box is available and can be used for interaction between participants. Please use the chat responsibly. The co-host of the meeting is Isabel. She is here to help you for any technical issue. So please don't hesitate to write to her directly using the private message option of the chat box if needed. Before digging into soil spectroscopy with our renowned speaker, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Lucrezia, who will provide a bit of background of a global soil partnership and the Glossolon. Lucrezia, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and thanks for being with us today. Just give me a second to share my screen. I hope that, uh, um, well, you can, uh, you can hear me well. And to start the presentation. Can you see? Yes. Okay, so as uh, Yi mentioned, I would like just to give you some brief information on the framework under which this uh, series of webinars is organized, starting from the very beginning. So who is organizing this uh, uh, webinar and this webinar series? So the webinars are organized uh, under the framework of the Global Soil Partnership that is a partnership established in 2012 uh, to position soil in the global agenda through collective actions. Indeed, our key objective is to promote the sustainable soil management and improve soil governance to guarantee healthy and productive soil. How we do this? Well, all activities are downscaled through and with the support of seven regional soil partnerships and additional support is provided by GSP partners and the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soil that is our highest body of technical experts on soil. Our work is uh, currently organized in, uh, in the thematic areas you see on the screen. And in addition to this, we have technical networks like the one on laboratories, so Grossolan, the one on black soils, the INDS, the one on fertilizer infa, and many other that help us implementing topic specific activities. I mentioned Glossolan. So Glossolan is the Global Soil Laboratory Network that was established in 2017 to build and strengthen the capacity of laboratories in soil analysis and to respond to the need for harmonizing soil analytical data. So in 2017, the network was established and it started to work on wet chemistry. So we focused a lot on training, harmonization, standard operating procedures, the execution of interlaboratory comparisons, and much more. Then in 2020, we launched the global initiative, the Glossolan Initiative on Soil Spectroscopy. And uh, right at the end of last year, again under Glossolan, we launched the International Network on Fertilizer Analysis called INFA. If you are interested to learn more about all of these, because I'm being very brief to give a space to go to start the, the webinar, uh, you can visit our webpage. And if you have any question on Glossolan in general, you can contact me at the email address you see on screen. Otherwise, if you have a, a question specific on spectroscopy, you can contact directly you. Just to close this very brief presentation, I would like to 
remind you that since the main objective of Glossolan and the Glossolan initiative on spectroscopy is to develop national capacities in soil analysis, we decided to start organizing a series of webinars. Now, because the audience uh, uh, has very different backgrounds and levels of knowledge on spectroscopy, the first three webinars provide basic knowledge on soil spectroscopy. Again, because one of the most frequently asked questions that we received was on how to build and use spectral libraries, we decided to focus the fourth and the fifth webinars on soil spectral libraries, providing concrete examples from France and Brazil. Ultimately, the six webinars that we organized until now will be about spectral measurement. Please note that this is just the beginning of our training program on spectroscopy and that the more webinars, online courses, instrument demonstrations, and others will come in the few months. And be aware that we are working to, to make uh, also these webinars available in multiple languages. This was my last slide. So I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very successful webinar. And thank you both for, for being with us today and providing us this information. So back to you, Yi. Thank you, Lucrezia, for this nice introduction on GSP activities. I now have the great honor to give the floor to Professor Bo Stenberg from Swedish University of Agriculture Science, a very well-known worldwide soil scientist. His research focuses on digital soil mapping and a variable rate fertilizer application in precision agriculture, proximal soil sensing, diffuse near infrared spectroscopy for soil analysis. He is, he is also one of the first soil scientists who started research on the topic of the soil spectroscopy. He and his co colleagues have also conducted the first comprehensive literature review on the subject of the soil spectroscopy. I, rem I remember that this paper was one of my first literature reading during my PhD study 10 years ago. Even now, I still read this paper sometimes if I have any question or doubt. The link to the research paper and another two important research work from Bo is now being posted in the chat. Without further ado, I would like to now give the floor to B Professor Bo Stenberg, please. Thank you very much. Do you see the correct screen now? Yes. And you can hear me as well. Yeah, go ahead. Good, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to give this seminar about uh, soil spectroscopy. And uh, this one is the first of a series, as you heard, and uh, it will be uh, mostly an introduction to soil spectroscopy. But at the end, if the time doesn't fly too fast, it, there will also be a, an example where we use um, a National Soil Spectral Library to, to map soils at the field or farm scale because my my interest in near infrared spectroscopy is, is as a fast and uh, simple and cheap method to get date get the inf the high density information about soils that we need for precision agriculture um, so so my background is 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 uh, the practitioners when it comes to near infrared spectroscopy, what I have learned and what I will try to add some of it to, to, um, to, to talk about here is, is I have learned by, by practicing near infrared spectroscopy on soil and also to and try to understand the things that I think that I need to understand. Um, so it will be from a user's point of view, pretty much. But we have also worked, me and my colleagues have also worked a little bit with trying to understand a little bit more about what is going on in the, in the soil spectra, what, what's actually affecting the spectrum. So just jumping into it directly, this is two different soils, the spectrum of two different soils is the reflectance spectra because that's what we measure and what is reflected from the incoming energy source, which is a light source. Uh, is what is not going somewhere else. And <laughs> with somewhere else, it could be scattered away from the detector. 
it could be absorbed by something in the soil, a chemical activity in the soil. And that's mainly what we are after. That's the information we want to need, uh, want to read from, from the spectrum and extract from the spectrum. So these are two different soils. One is more very much organic and one is, is less organic. And you can guess which one is which. I think later on I will come up with an answer. Um, I will not talk only about the near infrared spectroscopy or near infrared region of the spectra, but also about the visible part of the spectrum. Because the instruments we use today often enough contain both. Uh, and both are valuable for, for detecting different uh, properties of the soil. Um, Visible is usually, that's of course what we can see with our eyes, and it's from three or 400 nanometers, depending on who you ask, up to 700, 780, also depending on who you ask. Uh, and then from that, the part of the mid, uh, of the infrared uh, part of the spectrum nearest to the visible, that's why it's called near infrared. Uh, it's up to about 2,500. Sometimes you can re see also uh, 3,000 nanometers. Uh, so in, in visible and near infrared, we usually talk about wavelengths on nanometers. Um, if you, when you come up in, into the mid infrared, for some reason, everyone talks about wave numbers and frequencies, uh, with, which are directed in another direction. So that the, high, the higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency. So the frequency decreases towards the right, and the wavelength increases. Uh, actually, I should also say that there is, oh yeah, here's the frequencies for the visible and near infrared, if you want to see that. Uh, but I will only talk about wavelengths, uh, almost only, at least, uh, with one exception. Uh, there is one source for confusion, and that is that in some communities of research or uh, applications, uh, NIR, near infrared, is defined up to about 1000 nanometers, and then up to 2500 or 3000, it's short wave infrared. It's especially in the remote sensing community, you will see that. So I guess that many of you have come across this definition, and it's, uh, it's just like it's just how it is. So it's, um, but it's good to know that both definition exists. Uh, of the speakers for this uh, webinar series, I think at least uh, Ayel Bendor, the last one, he will use this other definition. I'm quite sure about that. Uh, the reason why we want to use uh, visible near infrared spectroscopy is, first of all, because it's extremely fast. Once you have the spectrophotometer and the soil in place, it's a question of seconds to get the spectrum. Uh, and afterwards, uh, nothing has happened to the soil. There are no chemicals or anything like that involved. Uh, and you don't really need to prepare your sample very much. You get better spectra and it's easier to use the spectra if they are from dried and sealed soils, but you don't, it's not, absolutely necessary. Uh, the instrumentation can be built very flexible. There are, you, you can uh, get it almost any way to present your sample to the instrument or vice versa, depending on which instrument you use. And some instruments are very, you can use very many different uh, sample presentation uh, techniques. Um, or, and in addition to being flexible, the instrument can be built very um, rugged and durable. Uh, so you can use an instrument in the field, you can put them on a tractor, you can put them in an airplane, you can send them up in a satellite, and that, that is done too. Um, and of course, once you have the spectrum and you need a calibration, we will get back to that. Uh, you can analyze several different properties of the soil from, from one single spectrum, but with a few dots. So what is the near infrared then in more detail? Well, of course it's, it's 
absorption at different wavelengths hold information on the chemical composition of the material. That's a general idea. Um, and in the visible region, also that the energy coming in through the light source into the sample, it, it, can, it makes the energy level in the visible part is higher than further up in the spectrum. And it can cause the electrons to excite to a higher energy uh, shell or orbit. Um, and, but with the longer wavelength in the near infrared, the energy level is lower and, and the uh, molecular bond starts to vibrate or this cause to vibrate. And that's what causes uh, absorption. Um, so the good thing here is that a specific bond in a mo molecular bond uh, requires a certain amount of energy to, to vibrate. And each wavelength or band in the spectrum correspond or holds a, a certain amount of energy. Uh, so that means that the bond absorbing its a specific amount of energy will only affect one band in the, in the spectrum. And that's why we can gain information from, from the spectrum. Uh, now, the, in the near infrared, we don't have the fundamentals as we call them. That is when the energy, there is a one-to-one -one fit between the requirement and the energy in the, in the band. But those can be found in the mid infrared. So for example, if we have a, the fundamental at about 3000 nanometers uh, in the mid infrared, then we can have um, overtone in the near infrared uh, with twice as much energy that can be shared to, with two bonds. Uh, and so that would be about 1500 nanometers. We also have combination bands. And that's when, for example, you can see that there are three different uh, types of vibration here and that each of those require different amounts of energy. And one of the stretching vibrations can be combined with a, a bending the V2 stretch, uh, vibration. And the fundamentals for each of those are different in the mid infrared. And if you summarize that energy, you, can, you will find that in the lower combination band in the, in the upper range of the near infrared. Uh, so two different types of vibration in the same bond can, can um, share one quantum of energy. So, so that's how it works, it's as simple as that. Um, uh, to look a little bit more closely into this, uh, we have an example of water. Uh, the fundamentals V1, V2, V3 is the same example as before. That's a frequency and or the lambda one, lambda two, lambda three is the corresponding wavelength is, is the inverse. Uh, the first overtone then is a double twice the energy, uh, the frequency or half the wavelength. The combinations, it's much easier to calculate from frequency. We just summarize the frequencies uh, and then you can take the inverse uh, and get rid of lots of zeros and stuff. And, uh, and then you have the, uh, uh, a shorter wavelength um, in the near infrared. Uh, so for example, we have the, well, let's see, we can do like this. Uh, if we have three different, the three different fundamentals for these three, uh, you can see that the first overtone is half the wavelength, as I said here, and also we can combine v, V1 with the uh, V2 and V2 with V3. Uh, and and when we do that, we get uh, an absorption band in in the near infrared as the combination bands in the upper part. I was afraid my slides wouldn't change. Uh, so, what kind of information can be found in the vis visible near infrared? Well. Uh, I gave you the example of water, and that's not a coincidence because water absorbs very strongly in the near infrared. Uh, 
especially at the 400 and 1900 nanometers. Uh, and, but also absorption by vibration of molecular bonds from between bonds between a large and a small atom, like C, carbon to hydrogen, oxygen to hydrogen, nitrogen to hydrogen. Uh, and as you can understand, we see from that it's organic mo molecules. The near infrared is a quite narrow range. So it's not very, very many uh, functional groups or bonds that actually do absorb that. So it's a manageable number, but, but instead, since it's overtones and combinations, it's a bit messy. Uh, lots of overlaps and, and, and the same thing will show up in several places and, and different things will show up in the same place. So, so, so it's a, the spectrum as such is quite confusing. Um, but it is still, it's, it's used for, several different things uh, in agriculture, forage and grain quality. And that's, I think, is uh, where it's all started, actually. The pioneers, uh, for example, Carl Norris, Phil Williams, and John Schenk, who, who are regarded as being the pioneers for near-infrared spectroscopy development uh, during the 60s and 70s. They, they um, uh, all, oops, all worked with the, uh, forages and, and grain quality, not with soil, but in, still in the agriculture arena. But also in the food industry for process control and quality control, pharmaceutical industry, medicine, a little bit, uh, petrochemical industry, and yeah, everywhere where you have organic materials, it's, you can be sure to at least somewhere find, find uh, near infrared spectroscopy in use. Actually, it's quite little used in, for, in commercially in, in soil. But it, it starts to show up in different labs and so on. So it, actually, it has been there for a couple of years, but not, not, not as for forages and grain, because that's the main method used. Uh, at least in Sweden and large parts of Europe, it's, that's a method used, and in the uh, United States and Canada as well. And probably many other places that I don't know about. Uh, OK, so just move over to soil. Uh, Compared to those other things I just mentioned, soil is, ex is extremely complex and diverse. Although you can say that it's two, there are only two main constituents apart from water. Uh, it's the mineral and organic fraction. But these two fractions are highly diverse and variable. Uh, and and the, it can be a mixture of lots of thing, things in the same soil. So there, there are not two soils even though there are only a few meters between them that are exactly the same. Um, and also the structure of the soil will influence the spectrum. Even if you have, a, of course, in, if you go out into the field and measure directly, you have lots of influence of the structure, but also in the lab, you will have effect of the structure. Clay soils aggregate in various ways. You don't necessarily destroy that in the sample preparation. Uh, while sa sandy soils are single grain, so you, you won't have that effect. And the, the coarser the structure, the higher the scattering of, of, the, of, the, of the reflected light. So that means that more, if, a, if the scattering is high, more, a larger part of the reflection is actually missing the detector. So you have, will have in, in total a, a lower reflectance, which will look like a higher absorbance. But it isn't. So the, the main factors influencing soil spectra are actually the main constituents of, of soil, clay minerals and organic matter, but also, of course, water and, as I said, the structure. And I will tell you a little bit about each of these. There is a two or three slides about each. We start with water, which probably have the greatest effect if, there is, if it's not dry, of course. Uh, so the main features in the spectrum are at around somewhere around 1400 nanometers and also 1900 nanometers. You will all in all soils you will find these two peaks even in the dry soil um, because there is you can't dry a soil completely. Uh, 
at 1400 nanometers, we said that before, it's the first overtone of the, of the stretch fundamental at 2850, 70 uh, that me, um, nanometers. So that's 1435 to be exact. Now, the world isn't perfect, so it may, may shift a little bit from, from the calculated value. Uh, at 1900, it's um, a combination of the, uh, the bending and stretching uh, vibrations from 6080 and 2870. Uh, and the corresponding uh, frequencies, you, if you have a calculator, you can add those two to each other and take the inverse and move the uh, decimal point to the right quite a few steps. And then you will get the nanometers. And that will end up with 1950, actually, not 40, but that's uh, just a technical question. Um, so that's where the main features of water can be found. There are other places as well. But if you if you look at the no, I was hoping to have a, yeah, there it came. There is a delay. Um, this is the same soil, the absorbance spectrum from the same soil. The uh, line at the bottom here is the dry air dry or 105 degrees dried soil, uh, also with a flattened surface. The absorbance looks quite comparably low, or the reflectance is high compared to where we add 12.5 in the first step, the dotted line, 20% to 30%. And then wet is when it's, the soil is saturated, it's simply too much water. Uh, but not very much too much, but it's uh, like a wet surface, not just moist. Uh, what we can see here is, is that the absorbance increases or the reflectance, reflectance decreases when we add water, especially with the first step. Uh, we can also see that these water peaks that I mentioned increases even more. So that's kind of logical. Uh, we can also see a difference between the, the visible part and the near infrared part of the spectrum. In the near infrared, it just continues to increase that sort of absorption. And that is that the water itself absorbs. The molecules in the water continues to absorb. Uh, and that will continue until there is only water, so to say, that the, the soil is too deep down to have an effect on, on, on the spectrum. Uh, so that will just continue. Um, while in the near infrared, uh, sorry, while in the visible part of the spectrum, it, it quite soon stops to increase the absorption. And that is because it's as soon as all the surfaces are covered with water, nothing more will happen. And that's because this is not direct uh, or absorption of the water in itself. It's, it's actually more like a diffusion or, or um, uh, that the, it has to do with the, as I understand it, with the refractive indexes between and the difference in refractive index, because the difference in refractive index between air and soil is high. And that will means that the light is reflected with a small angle and lots of it is reflected back and hits the detector. While the difference between um, the, in the refractive index between water and soil is low. They are more similar. Or you can say both are kind of dark. Uh, and then the angle is more wide, wider or more open and, and the energy or light will just penetrate. You can compare that with a window and a, and a mirror. In a window, the difference between the refractive index between air and the glass is small. And you can see right through it, uh, and the opposite with with a mirror. So it's it's kind of the same thing here. That's my picture of it in a way. Um, now moving over to clay. Uh, clay, the clay fraction is simply size fra fraction. That's the definition of clay. It's a or mineral particles smaller than two microns. And that could be, and to a large extent is 
secondary layered clay minerals like elite, smectite, monoclonalite, kaolinite, vermiculite, and whatever. Uh, while and but it could also be primary minerals like quartz and feldspar, but that, those would primarily uh, turn up in the in the silt and sand fractions. Uh, carbonates there are some soils very rich in carbonates, and that will turn up in the in the clay fraction. In old weathered uh, tropical soils, preferably, you would find these red or yellow soils with lots of uh, gutite and hematite, for example. Then you have the sesquioxides or metal oxides, uh, which they are of course small and will turn up in, in, the, side, in the, the clay fraction. So it could be different things that turns up in the clay fraction. Um, so that adds to the complexity of soil, of course, this variety. And just to look at a few different minerals, we have three different minerals that are quite common in soils to the left. Uh, again, in, in weather, old weather soils, uh, you will find lots of kaolinite, um, which is characterized by, it's a one to one mineral, you, clay mineral you say, it's, uh, one octahedral and one tetrahedral sheet uh, joined together. Uh, and those sheets, those uh, double sheets then can be joined together quite uh, hard to each other. Uh, and then there you can find adsorbed water to the surfaces, also in dry soil at 1400. Uh, and in kaolinite, for some reason, there is a very characteristic uh, duplet. It's quite hard to see here, but it's there. But it's more visible here. And here, actually, it's not directly water. It's hydroxyl group joined to the uh, aluminium in the octahedral sheet on the on the mineral. And that we will find in other clay minerals as well. As well, and sometimes that aluminium is um, substituted to iron or or um, magnesium, and then you will find the absorption higher up, and that's what you can see here, and also in the in the elite. Uh, also characteristic for pure, this is our pure minerals. It's not from soil; it's uh, mined minerals. Is that in kaolinite we don't have any water trapped in the interlattice layer, as that is between the, the, the one one sheets. Um, but you can find lots of that in, in, in smectite or montmineralonite and a little of it in elite. You know, if you know that montmineralonite and smectite are known for its swelling uh, features, and that means that they can, there is much water coming in between. And, all, but, and lots of that, or comparably lots of that, is, is still trapped in dry soil. These are, to the right, we have soil, but here is one high in gypsum. It's from Iran. Uh, gypsum is a crystal with uh, lots of hydrated water, and that hydrated water shows up as, a, as distinct shoulders on this water peak. And also this one here at 1700 nanometers, which is, which is quite unique. Uh, when you add water to, a, to a, any other soil, you will get some absorption here, but not this strong. So this is a quite unique uh, feature of, of gypsum. Carbonate is uh, not very much, but there is a little that differs it from other things. But there is an absorption feature about 2300, which can be confused by things in elite, for example, but also by organic matter. Gertite and also hematite, they are a bit similar. You have in the visible, especially. Uh, this is a yellow one, and the, in the hematite, it's a little bit more to the rep, uh, right uh, absorption. And also, uh, in the very beginning of the near infrared, around 900 nanometers, you can have a, this wide bump, so to say, which, which peaks at the bottom just before 900 in gertite and just after 900 in hematite. But I, I guess. It's, most soils you will find a little bit of both. Um, I'm sorry about this delay, but my was are worryingly long. Hmm.
Maybe you can stop sharing and then just go to the next. Yeah, one. I actually need to, I think, but I can't do anything. Yeah, I can stop share. Sorry about this. I'm afraid I need to close my. You can still see me moving yeah. as well. Yeah, it's not it's not the network then. Maybe you may want to share on behalf of uh, Professor Stenberg now. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, working on it. Otherwise, we can share it from our side. Ah, OK. OK, great. Uh, I guess. Like that? Yeah. Yeah, let's leave that one and continue with organic matter. <laughs> um, so this is uh, three different soils, one organic, more or less organic at least, uh, one with low soil organic carbon, but high in clay. That's the dotted one at the bottom in the visible. And uh, one, another one high in sand, also low in soil organic matter. Um, and that's the one in, in the middle uh, in the visible. Uh, and we start with the visible, uh, and it's no coincidence actually that that it's uh, like this, because um, as, as you know, an organic soil is dark, um, and uh, this is absorbance, so that means that it's it's high, so the reflectance is low, which makes it dark, uh, and then the the clay is. Uh, the, the brightest of them. So it, 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 um, it absorbs less, reflects more. Uh, and we can, since it's in the visible part, we can actually look at this by with our eyes instead of a, of a strange spectrum. Uh, and what we have here is to the left, we have two soils. It wasn't easy to find those, but <laughs> with 100% sand, no clay at all. Uh, in one of them, the, at the bottom, there is no organic matter at, at all. And then the other one on top, it's a little bit of organic matter, not very much, though. Uh, but still, it's obviously much darker. Despite the very low amount of organic matter, you can, you can see an obvious shift in, in color. Uh, and these are two eilitic Swedish clay soil, which are quite bright. The clay soils have a much larger surface area, of course, and it's still it's 40% clay, but it doesn't really need to be 40%. It could, it's enough with 10% and we, you will have a similar effect. And then the difference between the soil with 2% organic matter, the soil organic carbon and 0% uh, zero, zero of the soil organic carbon and 2%. And uh, I think I won't use this laser point because I think it started to slow down when I opened that actually. So, um, and you, you don't really see any difference in color. It's slightly, slightly darker this one on top, but not very much. And that's the, the, because of the larger surface area, you get kind of dilution of the organic matter. It's, uh, the layers are much thinner and you can't see it that easily as you can in a coarse sand soil. So that's why we have that effect. Now, and then if we focus on the near infrared, now this spectrum starts at, at about 1,000 1, nanometers in the near infrared. Um, we have some you can find in the literature, and I have also seen them in, in published. I think you have, we have one of those the paper where this is a little bit more described. But uh, one band that is you can find in the literature is 1660. I have never seen that. but the, 
maybe it's somewhere else in some other source. I've never seen any effects of organic matter there. On the other hand, there is this duplet at 1728 and 1754, uh, which is, I found to be very, very important for, for, um, for measuring the organic matter content. And, um, and at least this 1728, it, it relates to the alkyl group. It's, there are strong duplet, actually, strong absorption features in the middle infrared, and the overtones is fine here. And, and the a combination of that is find, found here at 2306. Um, so these are alkyl groups, uh, which are like, and those are primarily, it's more of those in the well, well uh, degraded organic matter, because it's in the short chains and also in the ends of the longer chains, but in the well degraded organic matter or well decomposed organic matter, the long chains are shorter. So you will have more of those end point uh, groups. Um, Johanna Wetterlin, a colleague of mine, has, has done some work on that and tried to establish what, what turns up where, and that is a continuing work. It's, it's quite interesting. Because one reason for this that is that we have, in, in, for Swedish soils, for some reason, our, we are, the calibrations for organic matter is quite bad for, for, on a national scale, much worse than in most other countries or parts of the world. On the other hand, hand uh, our calibrations for clay is clay content is much better. So you can't win them all. Um, so over to structure, the effect of structure. Uh, the two ones in the middle, the blue and the green, are um, the sand. And it's the sieved sand and the milled sand. But it's not really any difference because the sand is a single grain soil and, and uh, a, a ball mill that we used here don't really affect that. It might crush some of them, but it's no real effect. While the aggregates in the clay soil, it uh, uh, goes from a quite coarse powder to a very, very fine powder. And, and what we see here is that the uh, sieved clay with the aggregates intact, small aggregates, uh, up to two millimeters, they are still there and we have a lower reflectance. More of the, of the energy light is, uh, is scattered. And but when we uh, put it through a ball mill, we have a very, very smooth surface and more of the energy is reflected. So, so that's a kind of albedo effect, which is not really what we're after. And as, as you can understand, when we compare different types of soil, this albedo effect would be the main thing that will be seen. That's, uh, so, so we really would like to get rid of that. And that can actually be done by different types of scatter correction or pre-transformation of, of the spectrum, which is usually done. And there are many, many different ways to do that. But one, a good start is the first derivative. For soil, that's a very good start because it usually works well. Often it's found to be the best one of several tested. Uh, so, and then, then you can see that the, we accentuate the actual features of the spectrum. This is also only the near infrared, not the visible, but it's, it doesn't really matter, it's the same thing. So there are some drawbacks also. I, before I mentioned the positive things with, with NIR, I think I did, I don't remember now, but yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> Uh, but the, the drawback is, as I mentioned, that the, the specs are quite messy or complex or hard. You can't read really, you can't read really a peak height or a peak uh, area uh, to and directly read uh, the content of clay or organic matter or something else from that. Uh, you need a reference data set. You need to model, make a model to use on new samples. And you need to make that model from known samples. So, so, and that the number of samples you need that depends on the diversity of soils you want to 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 predict or uh, estimate something in. And also, which can be seen as a drawback, it's not necessarily a drawback, but the calibrations tend to be empirical, so they are kind of black box. Um, so the principles for making calibration is that 
I will not go through every, all the techniques for this. There is no time for that. But but you need to start off with a, uh, some reference samples and pick out cal calibration samples from those. It could maybe good to save some for validation. Or maybe pick out new. That's the, actually the best to pick out new, so they are totally independent. But you need a calibration set with spectrum and reference data for, with a reference method or standard method for what you, what you want to measure. Um, and then you make a calibration with some multivariate technique that can use all the data points in the spectrum. It could be 1,000 or 2,000 data points in the spectrum. Uh, part your least squares regression, PLS, is probably the most common. PCAR used to be the most common, which is a kind of similar. It's liner multivariate techniques, uh, as is um, uh, multiple line regression, but you can't really use that because there are too many uh, variables. So you use this PLS or PCR, which is uh, kind of dimensional reduction techniques. So you ex with few latent or replacing components or factors, you maybe a handful or 10 or 12, you, you replace the, the, all those 1,000 or 2,000 uh, spectral bands in, in your, your spectrum. And then uh, the last 10 or 20 years, more and more use of, and also with the larger data sets available, more and more use of, of more fancy methods like uh, memory-based learner, which is kind of PLS, but also with uh, non-linear or data mining techniques or machine learning, whatever you want to call them. The support vector machines, uh, neural networks, uh, regression trees, and, and all that stuff. Um, where there are, I have actually compared all these methods, and I have found that uh, not very surprising. But you, you won't do miracles with a more fancy <laughs> method. It might be a little bit better, but no miracles. Um, and then you use this model to predict your unknown samples where you don't have a reference. But it's very important that the calibration samples are representative of, of the samples you later on want to, to estimate. And also that you validate. That's very, very important that you validate and it, you ver validate with independent data sets. There are lot, lots of, if you read the literature on near infrared spectroscopy and probably other techniques. There are very many papers which are a bit doubtful in that respect. Uh, there is something called CMA replication, for example, where if you have your pick your calibration samples from clusters, several clusters, and you pick out your calibration and validation samples from by random, then you will have more or less similar samples in both the calibration and the validation data set, and then they are not really independent. So, so you, it's important to make sure that your validation data is actually independent in relation to where you want to use your, your model. So you need, need to think there, and that too often it's not thought about to, enough. So that's a take home message. Um, so the validation or calibration, it's a way of relating the Y space to the X space and, or the dependent to the independent and, and which is in, for example, this case is the clay to spectra. Clay is the X space, uh, a Y space or the dependent variable and the spectra is the X space or independent variable. Uh, so in, in a validation situation, you have the answer and you can relate your measured values to your predicted values or vice versa. But in the prediction scenario, you don't have the answer. So, so you don't really, you don't know how good it is actually, but the software packages that you use, they often provide you with some kind of uncertainty measurement, which is related to how well the sam predicted sample relates to the model or is represented by the model. Uh, so that give you, gives you some indication. There are also lots of different statistics used um, 
And the most common, I think, is the R square, which is uh, just the, how much of the variation, variation that is explained by the model. Also, the residual mean square error or roots mean square error uh, is very common, RMSE or RMSE is all often followed by a, a additional letter, residual mean square error prediction P, cross validation CV, or, or just C for calibration. Um, the RMSEP is very much very much similar to as uh, as is calculated to a standard deviation, uh, but instead of being the average distance absolute distance to the mean is a average absolute distance to the to the model, which is the the line here in the one to one line. Um, so it's a, a absolute average distance to to that to that line. The uh, RPD is a ratio of performance to deviation, which is often used as the standard deviation uh, um, divided by, by the error. So that should be a large number. Um, uh, R square should be as close to one as possible, and uh, RMSE should be um, low, as low as possible. Okay, I think I jump these. Um, large, one thing that is, now I will give an example if you are not falling asleep. Most of you are still there, so we continue. Um, a little example, or it's, it's not that small, but, but, but it's been popular to build large spectral libraries, but libraries that can be used as a rational method for predicting samples, new samples in a large wide area. Uh, and many of these calibration perform well when you validate them in their own scale. And this is a Swedish national soil library. It's about 12,000 agriculture soils. We built the model on about one third of these, those and validated on the rest. So, and the validation here is what you can see the best we could do and it's actually done with one of those memory based learners and the memory based learner is the kind of pls where you you pick your uh, you take one sample uh, and you compare the spectrum of that sample with this with the uh, with all the spectra in the in the library and then you pick out a, according so, to some predefined uh, definition uh, a number of samples that are as similar to that sample you want to predict as possible. So spectrally, you may build a cali unique calibration for each sample or each group of samples or however you want to do it um, with spectra that are as similar as possible. So when you do that, you assume that when if the spectra are similar, also the soils are similar. So, so that's the intention. And it often works quite well. And it's become a popular method. Um, but now, how well will a large scale calibration work when we, if we want, for, as in my case, I, I'm interested in at the variation at a farm or field, actually the field scale. So just samples collected just uh, 50 or 20 meters apart. How well can such a model resolve that kind of variation at a completely different scale? And can will these models perform better, uh, these large scale models built on a large scale data set perform better than if we make a unique um, small calibration of just a few of those farm or field samples, say 10 to 50, 10 or 50, or somewhere in between, uh, which one will perform best? And that's what we tested. But before I show you that, I will show you what actually will happen when we, when we uh, uh, apply a large scale calibration to a small scale field. And if, you, if this is a large scale calibration, and the red dot represent 
soils in the field or a farm. And as you can see, that red dot uh, was carefully chosen to be far away from the model. So it's, it's not the best um, sample in, in this uh, calibration. But that's the type of soil we have in the field. Then we will have the, the, the um, ranking of the samples in the prediction of these new samples in the field will be quite good, but it, there will be a quite strong bias. Uh, and that's also what happens in real life sometimes. So this Haxta, as it's pronounced, uh, field to the left, uh, there we have a very small bias. Um, and that field is actually, the, the soils, that field is very well represented in, in our national model that type of soils, but Brenneberry, uh, which is close to where I am, um, we can see that the ranking is good, but the bias is very strong. And the SEP here, that's the RMSEP, but corrected for the bias. So if we assume just that the, we move it up to the to the one-to-one -one line, then the SEP is just about 0.12, and here it's still around 0.4 or 5, as it was from the beginning. So that very small difference here. Uh, but here the difference is large and actually it's much lower here. So actually uh, the prediction here is better than there. It might also be due to the smaller range. But still. Uh, so, so this is something to think about. And that's a problem we will have not only with near infrared spectroscopy, not only with organic matter as this is, but that's the kind of, that will have happen with most techniques for at least for soil. Um, so this is kind of universal phenomenon. Not very strange, actually. Um, so validation at the field scale. We compare the national scale global PLS, just the straightforward PLS, the memory-based learner, which was selecting the most similar samples. And then we select them to the field to get rid of this uh, bias, for example. And the national uh, source vector library, which we spiked with. So we tried to make the model to move the model in the direction of, of the type of samples we have in the field. And also just without using the, the National Soil Spectral Library at all, just to make a few sample calibration for the particular farm. We had 11 farms, uh, four measured with the same instrument as our um, National Library, and seven farms measured with a completely different in instrument, a very different instrument actually. Um, which is an uh, important feature in this <laughs> project. It was a bit unfortunate, but we got some interesting results from it. And, and the bars here is a variation of clay, uh, so, soil organic matter and, yeah, sorry, yeah, soil organic matter and clay content. And as you can see, the variation in each uh, form can be almost, or a large part of the variation we'll have for the entire Sweden all of these 12,000 samples. So, so the variation at the small scale can, can be quite big. We have two different instruments. We try to make those the spectrum spectra for those instruments similar. Uh, there are techniques for that. We use something called piece five star X standardization. And, and, and you can see the A and B here are the original spectra, the FOSS, which was a uh, outlying instrument, so to say, not the one used for the library. And, the, and then we have the field spec down here, uh, which we also use for the library. Uh, so that's the kind of spectrum we wanted. The, the albedo here is just to, to make it clearer. Uh, so we transformed the, based on 18 standard samples that were measured with both instruments. We tried to make them similar and they looked by, by air, eye very, very similar. We were very, very happy. But then we projected them on, on the large data set. And then we can see that the four farms with the same instrument, they were projected onto the uh, library, while the FOST instrument, despite of the transformation, they weren't. So it didn't really work. It, it did some, but not, it wasn't good enough. But we continued anyway. Why give up? Um, so this is the difference between PLS 
the small ones here, uh, and the memory-based learners. And as I said, we have problems with organic matter. Clay works very, very well. Very small residual mean square error, just 3.5. And then the reference method isn't much better than that. Uh, but organic matter should be better, but that's how it is. Um, so this is the result. So the red one here for the four forms with the same instrument, this is the PLS, not very good, uh, high RMSE uh, and large deviation between the four forms. Uh, using the memory-based learner, it improved things quite a lot, but it was quite high still, over about 6% clay. This is an example from the clay. But while with spiking, with only 10 samples, it improved the calibration quite substantially. Uh, and it was even better than with a low, just a local calibration. And that's what it seems to be, that with the, 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 the large li national library, it makes the modeling a little bit more robust. Then, even more interesting, when we move to the seven farms with a deviating instrument and the strange spectra, PLS was still about similar as, as, as with the, um, for the four farms, but a bit more deviation, but it was also three more farms. And the memory-based learner just, just failed. It was worse. And that's not so strange because if you try to pick out similar samples to, to something that is deviating from the beginning. It, it must be, it's just stupid. So, <laughs> so in a way it's good that it, it failed, it should fail. But the interesting thing is with spiking, with just 10 samples, we, we also, and that's, I said, there are rarely any miracles. It, it, we can improve with different techniques uh, a little bit, but not no miracles, but this is at least close to a miracle. It's probably not a miracle, but it's, it's a much bigger effect than I would have expected. Uh, so, so this spiking thing is, is quite good. And you can do, probably do this in other ways, just to use maybe two or three samples to, to adjust the baseline, um, at least in this case, in the, in the four forms where, where we have the same instrument to begin with. Uh, maybe it might be a little bit more complicated here with the seven forms. Um, and this is uh, the and that was for 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 clay and um, for organic matter it looks more or less the same it's the same type of results uh, and these are the results in visualized uh, so the standard uh, the normal PLS straightforward PLS you see the strong bias we get rid of most of the bias with the memory based learner uh, and this is one of the four forms um, and with spiking it improves even more. And it's actually better than the, the local calibration with, with 10 samples from, from just that far without the National Library. So that's, that's the results from that. Um, so the conclusions are that the largest, there are large systematic errors to, to be expected if you apply a large scale uh, model or large scale uh, reference data sets to, to a small scale situation. Uh, but that can be managed, but with some extra effort. So we actually lose some of the advantages with quick and easy uh, measurements of the near infrared. We need to do uh, some more reference measurements, but probably not very many. And you can also look at the situation where neighbors, for example, join together and you can use just 10 samples, but for the twice the area or something like that. So, but there are things that need to be further studied there. But yeah, it, it could be, there are opportunities. So that was all for me. Many thanks, Sebo. Yeah. For this, uh, it was a little bit long, but uh, actually not too much longer than an hour. <laughs> I think it's a great presentation. I think it gives us a very comprehensive introduction on the soil yeah. spectroscopy, also giving us some future perspectives about what we can do with this technology in the real application. 
And uh, I think we can have uh, 10, 15 minutes left for some discussion. I saw quite a lot of uh, questions. I try to answer many of them, but then there's uh, too many. I think uh, we can only select a few of them to answer uh, live. And if, uh, unfortunately, we cannot answer all of them, but if uh, there is some question we couldn't address live, so please feel free to write an email to, to Bob because previously we uh, shared uh, his uh, web page. There is his email, so probably he can have some more detailed answer. And uh, some of the, I think in the very beginning, I saw a question is, uh, it's quite interesting, I guess, uh, his, uh, he, uh, Bob, his, He's your colleague or former colleague or friend is Thomas. He said that, uh, I, uh, are you aware of the proficiency test scheme aimed for spectral analysis? Sorry, the? Proficiency test. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Maybe I am, but not under that name. <laughs> no. So if, no. It's, if it's a validation technique or what? I, I, I guess he's mentioned about the, the variation of the spectral data between uh, labs or instrument. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is actually a, an obstacle in general for near infrared spectroscopy. That is, it's, um, even if you have the same brand and the same or the same type of uh, model of instrument, they, they, they differ. Okay. Um, so, so model transfer between instrument, that's a big issue in, in near infrared spectroscopy. So that's actually another drawback that I didn't mention, but, but lots of work is going on managing that. Um, and there are some, for example, FOSS, uh, Tecator, they, they have networks of instruments where they try to handle that in the kind of network <laughs> arena. And they take pay for that as well. <laughs> and I, I saw a few questions that are inter, uh, comes from, I guess it comes from the region uh, where is the sort affected soil is. They ask that if a high sort content has some, the spectral will get affected or not. High soil? Sort, the senility. Well, yeah, yeah. Ooh. That's, we, we don't have much of that. So my experience is a bit low, but there is, um, it, it's used to say that, I mean, water, pure water is a special, special type of spectrum. And to answer one of the questions that pops up all the time is, can we, can we predict the uh, nitrate and phosphate or other <laughs> salts? We, we can't really, because the, they don't absorb. It's quite simple. They, they, salts don't absorb in the near infrared. But, but, but the salts, if you put salt into, water, the spectrum of the water will change. But it's not the salt that absorbs, but the salt affects the water. Uh, okay. so, so the matrix of something affects the bond so that it, it absorbs in, in slightly different way. So, 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 and I have actually said that several times, before. for example, with the example of gypsum, uh, the hydration of the gypsum, it, it, it pops up new kind of feature we, we can't see in another mineral that, that is it's, it's water bound to the gypsum in, in different ways that compared to other minerals. So we see other features and different minerals absorb differently. And it's, it's, it's often water in, in, in connection to the mineral, clay mineral that, that gives the, the spectral features. And I, I didn't say that, but uh, we, we often distinguish between primary and secondary calibrations or, or, uh, and, or absorbance. And organic matter, of course, it absorbs directly, water absorbs directly. But when it comes to clay, I think I, I kind of tend to say it's the primary absorbent, but it really isn't because we, we, if you are interested in the clay content, it's, many it's built up of, as I said, many different things. And it's the mineral that absorbs. And that, but that relates so strongly and in a quite stable way to, to, to the content. So, so it's, it's almost like it's a primary <laughs> absorbent, but, but actually it isn't, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think the, well, another interesting question from what I could see so far is that I think most of the colleagues or the audience are interested about the, 
how this technology can can facilitate uh, in a fertilizer recommendation. I don't know if you have any experience or we can hear some of you about the yeah, future perspective. Yeah, yeah that, that's kind of how we want to use it because, uh, but it's it not directly that, that you, as I just said, that, that, that nutrients, the plant available nutrients generally don't absorb. So you, but, but, but usually, but you, what you can do is that you, in mechanistic models, you, you try to model the nutrient cycling and so on. It's, it's not that easy. <laughs> we try to use that in, in precision agriculture and, it's, and the models are not simply not good enough. But, but I mean, there is a relationship between the, the soil type, especially if you go not just look at the surface. And that's, that's a problem we'll have, we have with almost everything that we just look at the surface. But, but the soil profile is, is important. Um, so, so the, I mean, on a more general, uh, from a more general point of view, it's um, the, the soil type is relevant for also for fertilization, but not, we can't really measure it directly. Yeah, so, yeah so I already it, have- To get a better view of the soil and it's, I mean, how much nutrient that is needed? It's, it that also depends on how how much water you have. I mean, there are other things that restrict the crop that you need to, to consider. So, so I mean, you could if, even though the crop could use more nitrogen, for example, uh, and you add that, and then it you have it's dry <laughs> and no irrigation, then it, it doesn't help. So. So, I mean, agriculture is complex as it is, but, but you can't read the nutrients directly, the, the value, plant value nutrients. With some, I, I'm not definitely sure about phosphorus because there are some papers that might indicate that in some circumstances, at least, that you, there might be more or less, at least, uh, direct information about plant-available phosphorus. The problem with plant-available phosphorus is that, it, that it's, it's measured in so many different ways. And, <laughs> and also, it's, levels, a, so. it's a moving around. Yeah, yeah. It's not so stable. No. So I think... Uh, I, maybe it's more stable than nitrogen, but, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the fertilizer, uh, fertilizer recommendation also need to take more uh, soil properties uh, or other factors as a consideration, not just the measurement of the MPK. That's uh, also my understanding. And I think the last question, we can uh, make it an easy one, since this is, the, is a part of our training program. Uh, one question was asking what specifically spiking means. I think it's better to to, yeah. Because in a future application, yeah, it's better it, to let people understand. We, we I, I've done some work with Rafael Vizcarra Russell, and we de debated the word spiking quite a lot. But he, after a while, he was satisfied with spiking. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the best. He thought spiking is something you do with drinks, <laughs> and, and that might be true. But uh, and he should be better in English than I am. But but. <laughs> But what we mean with spiking is, is that we actually extend the calibration data set with some a, a small number of local samples um, to move the model in the direction of that to that type of, of soil. And uh, so if we add 10 samples, we don't just add 10 samples because if the spectral library is very large, we also we multiply them perhaps 50 or 100 times or something too. To, to make the influence larger. Uh, but you, you probably can do that in another way, just to, to use the spectral library. If it's just a bias, you can uh, use a calibration from the spectral library as it is, and then just move the, <laughs> by two or three, if you pick the right two or three samples, <laughs> uh, that covers the range. Uh, then you can move the, the the baseline, so to say, to the to the center of the model. So so maybe you can do it with much less than ten samples also. Okay. But there is, I guess, there is a limit because you, you will never know exactly which are the best samples. You you will never have the answer, the right answer. The, you will never have that because if you get that, you you there is no use of the method. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I think the spiking. I mean, I guess it will work because it brings some um, local information. Yeah, it yeah. It, it, it's just about index. moving the model in the right direction, just to give it a little push in the right direction. <laughs> uh, I think the it's it's more or less in the ending part of the our webinar, and uh, for sure we cannot answer all of the questions. I can see there are. There are I still have a 50, 50 questions waiting for the answer. Otherwise, yeah, we, yeah. we will finish in six o'clock today. So, if I would suggest, uh, I would recommend that the participants, if uh, I'm very, first of all, I'm, I apologize, we cannot answer all of your questions. No. I, I, if, yeah. if I could if, add the one though that I didn't mention that because I just mainly talked about clay and organic matter now, and that, that's because we know that they, there are strong relationships, uh, real relationships to, to, to the spectrum. Spectra. But for example, pH, it's often claimed that P, it has, that you can predict pH. And if, actually, if we do that with our soil spectra library, the Swedish soil with 10, 12,000 soils, we get a pretty good relationship between the spectrum and the pH. Not really a good calibra prediction model or calibration, but a relationship. And But, but protons <laughs> are not absorbing. <laughs> that's That's we know that. So, so what probably happens is, is that we measure the buffer capacity. Uh, and with the more clay and the more organic matter, the main constituents and the main um, things affecting the spectrum, they, they influence the pH. They have a large influence on the pH through the buffering capacity. And, and so it works in a way. But agriculture. I mean, <laughs> change that relationship. And if you lie, it, you just destroy that relationship. <laughs> so then it won't work. But so so it's, it might work, but it's a bit risky. But if you know what you're doing, you could, you, it's okay to use that kind of relationships, secondary relationships. Yes. I, I, I it's think, often done. Yeah. But yeah. You, you need to know what you're doing, I think. I was uh, in, during my PhD thesis, there part of chapter, I was trying to link the spectral information directly, indirectly linked to the Lyman application, try to get that, uh, that part. But uh, anyway, I, I, think the, I think that we are really in the end. And uh, sorry again, we couldn't uh, answer all of your questions, but you are very welcome to write an email to me or to the, to the Boston bird. And then we will, address your question by the email, we will be happy to uh, make a connection with you uh, after this uh, uh, after this uh, seminar. You will still hear from us and receive a shortly an email with the link to the recording and the presentation because we are because some of the colleagues due to the different time time zone, they, they couldn't join this seminar. So we will record and add it. Finally, we will upload to our web page and to inform you. And a very big thank you to our today presenter and uh, all of the participants. I think uh, I I think that we have reached around 600 uh, participants, uh, maybe a bit more even, to join the first webinar on soil spectroscopy. My colleague is now posting the link to the other five webinars scheduled on soil spectroscopy. And uh, you will in, you or you are all invited to join and register. Remember to check this page regularly as another series of uh, webinar on wet chemistry, health and safety, equipment purchasing, quality assurance and quality control and laboratory management will be organized in the next few months. And thank you all once again, and I wish you all a pleasant end of the day or evening. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you. And thank yeah. you. All thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.